Hey there folks, welcome to your lecture on symbiosis. Um, this is going to be a little bit more than just looking at the slides and copying down the definitions. Uh, definitely take the time to listen to the examples that are given because on your next assessment you will be expected to classify different examples of symbiotic relationships rather than just identifying definitions. So let's go ahead and get started. So um, before we can talk about relationships, let's go ahead and talk about individual organisms. First thing you need to know is what a niche is or niche, I say niche, a uh, description of an organism's use of resources in a community, um, habitat, food, reproduction, and the organisms it interacts with. So if you look at this bee with a flower, you can see that's its habitat, that's also what it eats. It's interacting with that flower and we know that that bee will go back to its hive, which is where it's um, where reproduction takes place. So um, another thing you need to know about individual organisms before we talk about um, how they relate to each other is the concept of tolerance. Some organisms have a very narrow range of tolerance. They're specialists. Um, what that means is they have a very small set of conditions. Uh, in which they can live. Um, so if you look at the koala on the right hand side, you only find them in Australia, they only live in the eucalyptus, eucalyptus forests, and they only eat eucalyptus. So they are specialists. Works great when things aren't changing, but when there's a changing environment, these guys don't do so hot. Um, and then you have generalists, like this um, rat in the city. Um, broad range of tolerance, they can eat a lot of different things, they can tolerate a lot of different conditions, a lot of different temperatures, so they do well lots of places. Um, this will become important when we start talking about how relationships change when um, uh, conflict is involved, how the two organisms deal with that, and you'll understand why it is that generalists can act some one way and specialists can act in another. So um, this is the actual list of symbiotic relationships um, that you need to know for this course. Um, competition, predation, parasitism, herbivory, uh, mutualism, and commensalism. Hopefully most of these, if not all of them, are familiar from your biology class. So I'm going to go kind of quickly through this. Do jot down the notes that you feel are necessary. Pause this video whenever you feel that you need to. Um, because although your assessments are always open note, they are timed, so um, having organized notes will save you time. Okay, competition. Two different species seek the same limited resource. Um, there are basically three outcomes. Um, one organism leaves, they subdivide the resource so they're no longer in conflict, or they, uh, uh, they die, basically. Um, so you have to think that, like a specialist, would uh, be more likely to go through emigration or competitive exclu exclusion rather than um, subdividing the resource. It's probably something more that a little bit of a generalist could do. Okay, so outcome number one, emigration. Um, if uh, you are being outcompeted by an organism that's better at getting a certain resource than you are, just go somewhere else. It will ensure that you your survival so um, you just move and hopefully find a place where you're no longer um, in competition. Um, the second one is called resource partitioning. And this is just the, the, the notion that in order to avoid conflict, um, every single organism that is um, fighting over a resource will um, kind of draw back and only use a part of it. Now this isn't a conscious decision. Uh, like in this example, you don't have all these birds getting together, the bird meeting and deciding who gets what. Um, it's just that uh, uh, their, their ranges of tolerance are, are big enough that they have certain parts of it where they're not in competition with any other organism. Um, you also have to think that um, getting hurt when you're an animal is, um, can, can mean death. There's no band-aids, there's no neosporin, so you want to avoid injury at all costs. So if that means subdividing your resource through resource partitioning, then absolutely that's the way that you uh, are going to go. And there are some terms that are associated with that. Um, oh, we'll get to that in a second. Here's some other examples of resource partitioning. So on the left, you have a giraffe that eats uh, vegetation really high, and the elephant eats the lower vegetation. And then here on the right, um, this hawk 
um, and this owl hunt the same kind of mice, but the hawk hunts them in the daytime and the owl hunts them at night. So resource partitioning can even just be different times um, as, as opposed to just uh, subdividing the using the resource all at the same time. So um, uh, this, this is also a part of resource partitioning. You need to know the difference between a fundamental niche and a realized niche. Um, a fundamental niche is everywhere that an organism can exist. You as a human being could exist pretty much almost anywhere in the globe. Your realized niche is, is your neighborhood and all of the places that you end up visiting. It's a much smaller subset of all of the places you could go and, and it's because again of outside pressures that kind of take all the possibilities and kind of narrow them down into um, an actual space that you end up. Um, here's an example you can see on the left this kind of barnacle which is basically a shell that sticks to a rock. These are all the places it could live but then on the right you can see that the blue barnacle came in and um, so they uh, underwent resource partitioning. So it's a good thing that this um, particular barnacle had such a wide range of tolerance because it was able to shrink its niche so that um, it could still exist. All right, so competition outcome number three is competitive exclusion. Um, that's a fancy word for going extinct. Um, we actually see this happening right now in Florida. On the left is the green anole, a kind of lizard that is native to Florida. And on the right, you see the brown or Cuban anole, which is an invasive species that is out competing that green anole. When I was a girl, many, many moons ago, you only saw the green ones. Now, um, uh, it's those, it's rare to see those. You see the brown guys all the, all the time. So the brown anole has outcompeted the green anole to the point that the green anole is going extinct here in Florida. Um, okay, let me see, make sure. Oh, go the other way. Oops, sorry guys. All right. So um, next relationship is predation. That involves one species of predator hunting and eating um, another prey. Um, while that's not good for the individual prey because they lose their life, um, this relationship is actually good for both populations because they help to control the numbers of each other. So if you take a look at this graph, you're going to notice that when, um, uh, okay, so a hare is a kind of rabbit and a lynx is a kind of big cat. Um, you're going to notice that when the bunny population goes up, the lynx population goes up. And then because there's a lot of predators, the bunny population then goes down and the lynx population goes down as well. Why is this good? Because um, if prey didn't have predators, um, they would uh, reproduce to the point that everybody would just starve to death because they'd run out of resources. So uh, while the relationship's not great for the individual prey, it's good for the entire population of the prey. It's also good for the predator. It keeps them at a, a reasonable number so there aren't too many of them. Then, and then they end up killing everything. Okay. So um, an interesting tap thing happens with predation. Um, uh, something called coevolution takes place, um, which means that if you if you remember evolution, it is um, organisms that are most suited to their environment end up surviving and reproducing to make the next generation. Well, if you have a predator on your case all the time, um, and he's picking off the ones that are weak, or you can see. Um, uh, them very easily. It's it's the ones that that are harder to find, or maybe have a or are poisonous, or any number of things um, that then, uh, because the predators are good at what they do, the the prey then a random mutation means that they are able to um, uh, survive to the next generation. What you're looking at right here is an example. Um, blue jays like butterflies, and it just so happens that this particular type of butterfly is able to eat a plant called a milkweed, which is poisonous, and store the poison in its body. So um, this blue jay caught this butterfly, it's called a monarch, and is eating it, and then after a couple of minutes, yaks the whole thing up. Um, it, uh, and then it learns, don't eat monarchs again, because it will poison you. So um, this is uh, something that monarchs did not always have, but through natural selection ended up having. Now remember again, this is not a conscious choice. It was just luck that the mutation popped up in the first place. If the monarch didn't have this mutation, it's entirely possible that the blue jay could have uh, forced it into extinction because it 
would have eaten them all up. Okay, parasitism is where one organism, a parasite, depends upon another organism, the host, for nourishment. It does not or it should not result in death, death of the host because if it does, then the parasite dies as well. Um, what you're looking at right now is the larvae or the babies of something called a parasitic wasp um, that latches onto this particular type of caterpillar and the, the baby wasp feeds on the caterpillar until um, it hatches out of its egg and then it goes about its merry way. Um, herbivory is basically like predation for herbivores. Animals feed on a plant. Um, uh, it's not technically parasitism. Uh, because, uh, you know, the, it's not a constant feeding and it's technically not predation because um, the, tr the like here the tree is not eaten until it's dead. Um, so it's kind of its own category. Um, Coevolution is actually part of the relationship that you're looking at right there. That is an acacia tree and a giraffe eating it. The acacia tree, as you can see, has developed some wicked, wicked spines as a result of the giraffe really liking um, the, these leaves. And now that happens over many, 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 many years. Um, it just so happens that the ones with thorns are the ones that survive more and are able to reproduce. Well, in response, the giraffe, the ones who were the most successful with the, with the acacia tree, were the ones with the longest and stickiest tongues. So most giraffes now have those long sticky tongues that they can then strip the leaves off of in between the thorns. So who knows what the acacia tree um, will uh, what evolution will will bring for it next. Um, mutualism is where both organisms benefit. Here you see a Nile crocodile and an Egyptian plover. It's a kind of bird um, and the Nile crocodile doesn't eat this thing um, and yet tolerates it in its mouth. So the plover comes in and eats little bits of food that are stuck in the teeth of the crocodile. Hold on one second. And the crocodile gets basically a free dental exam and gets bits of, bits of uh, rotting flesh taken out of its teeth so it doesn't end up with an infection. So mutualism is where they both benefit. Um, commensalism is an interesting uh, relationship. It's what I like to call the internet boyfriend relationship. It's where one organism benefits and um, the other one, yeah, actually I need to fix this. Sorry about that. I'm going to fix that right now on the fly. Um, a relationship between organisms, between two species that benefits um, one species uh, while the other species is unaware of the relationship. So let me go ahead and get this so the text fits. And here we go. So you get to see me fixing that on the fly. Okay, so commensalism, a relationship between organisms, um, uh, between two species that benefits one species while the other species is unaware of the relationship. So here you have something called a remora. Um, it has a suction cup on its head and it adheres itself to the bottom of uh, different types of marine life, including sharks. When the shark eats, it's pretty messy, so the remora pops off and eats and then pops itself back on, and the shark is just really not aware of the relationship. Um, here on the right is a ghost orchid that is native to southwest Florida. It uses the tree that it's on for support and also so it can get up high because it feeds on nutrients and water in the air, and the tree is neither hurt nor harmed by that relationship. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video for a second and see if you can fill this out by using the key. Uh, you have two organisms. Put a plus with the one that benefits, a minus with the one that's harmed, and then a zero where there's no impact. It doesn't know one way or the other. So again, um, draw this um, uh, table of contents in your notebook um, and then attempt to fill it out. So go ahead and pause and do that because this is a great review for the test. Okay, so go ahead and check yourself. Uh, competition, no one benefits. Um, uh, not after the competition, but during the competition. Predation, the predator benefits. You may want to make a note that that's the predator. Parasitism, the parasite benefits. Herbivory, the, the animal eating benefits. Mutualism, both benefit. And then commensalism, one benefits and the other's like, I'm sorry, what? 
And that is the end of your uh, lecture video. So um, go back and review this if you need to, but otherwise go ahead and uh, move on with the rest of the day's tasks.